Amen. Well, good morning, Grace Church. How are you? You guys are good? Good. Well, hey, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm glad you guys are here. If you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. My friend Miran would love to give you a Bible so you can check everything that we're saying is for real. It's actually in a book that's been published. Uh, It's the Word of God, I promise. Uh, As Miran is passing out the Bibles, I want to share something vulnerably with you. Uh, You may not think this is vulnerable, but I do. Uh, I recently got braces. There's my vulnerability. I'm gonna, uh, I, any, yeah, I had them when I was younger, and they're back. So uh, <laughs> you, you, you do what you want with that information. It's a long story. Uh, any adult brace gang? Anybody? Any, yeah, a few of you. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so if I spit or slur or whatever, just give me some grace. Uh, I'm under a lot of pressure, uh, <laughs> metaphorically and physically. Uh, cool. All right. Well, this is week 15 in the book of Mark, and uh, we're excited to jump in. Today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat a little bit. We're looking at the story of Jesus feeding 5,000, but we're going to parallel that with the uh, teaching Jesus gives in John chapter 6, right after he feeds the 5,000. So we're going to be back and forth between Mark 6 and John 6. So if you want to put both of those in your Bible, that would be helpful. All right. Well, in 1956, a uh, word was introduced in the English language. It was first printed in the psychoanalytical journal called the American Imago, and it was an article on accidental wordplay. And the wordplay was the blending of two words, the word hungry and the word angry, which created hangry. Wow, great. Uh, And the word hangry has had a long journey from 1956 to 2018, when in January of 2018, hangry was officially added to the Oxford English Dictionary. Way to go, hangry. Amen. Uh, Here's the definition of hangry. It is the state of anger caused by a lack of food. State of anger caused by a lack of food. May evoke negative change in emotional state. Uh, The everyday translation is feed me or I'll kill you. (laughs) That's that's, uh, that's how it plays out in the real world. Uh, My wife introduced me to a word called prangry, which is pregnant, angry, and hungry. Uh, (laughs) Or just called pregnancy. (laughs) Am I right? No? Okay. Be careful with that joke. Uh, A few years ago, Amy and I were driving to a Good Friday service for church, and we have three kids, which means everything is inefficient and awful, and I was so hungry, and I was running so late, and so we were going to stop at McDonald's. Don't judge us. We're going to stop at McDonald's, grab some food, and go quick. We hit the McDonald's that has the double lane drive through I'm like, navigating which one's going to be faster. I pick the faster lane. I know what my order is. And this is obviously a, an urgent moment. We're trying to hurry and we're all about to go crazy because the kids are hangry and I'm hangry. And so I, I hit the lane and I'm like, I'll have a chicken sandwich and we'll have two cheeseburgers and fries. And Amy, what do you want? And um, my lovely dear wife leans over me and says, hey, how's it going today to this person working? And they say, going great. Thanks for asking. And I, I'm, I'm taking some deep breaths. I'm like, all right, what's happening? And here, here's what my wife says, and I quote, because uh, I, I remember this, uh, deeply remember this. She said, hey, would you mind telling me the difference between a quarter pounder and a McDouble? Which is basically like astrophysics. So they, this lady's got to talk about the buns and the, the, uh, the amount of meat that goes here and how much this weighs and how it's made and why one's on the dollar menu and one's not. And then Amy listens to all that and then she leans over and says, uh, great, which one of those is your favorite? Like when you choose, which one's your favorite? Which one do you choose? And I'm like, how could you do this to me? Like why, uh, do you hate me? Like what did I do to you? Are, why are we married? Like, why are we married? That's, that's where we're at. The other cars are going by in the other lane. I'm just so, I'm, I'm panicked. And so finally, they, their conversation ends, and we go up, and we pay. And I'm like two bites into my chicken sandwich. And I'm like, oh, babe, I am so sorry. I love you. I don't know what happened in the past, but I didn't mean any of that stuff that I said. I, I didn't mean it. I'm so sorry. I love you so much. And two bites into my sandwich, the world made sense again. But something changes you when you are hangry. It's like I think every engaged couple should have a part of premarital counseling where they don't eat for a whole day and have to spend the whole day with each other. Because you're like, you're like, we love each other. And I'm like, you don't know that. You do not know if you love each other because you've never been hangry around each other. That's a deal breaker. It's it's real. It's a problem. Uh, But something happens when you take a couple of bites of food. You're like, Oh, wow. Okay, the, the world, okay, here we go. Makes sense again. 
And there is a parallel. I know it's a ridiculous story, but there is a parallel here from the, the physical hunger that, that can be cured by a couple of bites of a chicken sandwich and what's happening in Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6. Because many of us have this spiritual hangry, uh, spiritual hunger that we're walking around with, and we, we can't find the cure. And so we're just angsty and mad and frustrated all the time, and nothing, we seems, to, nothing seems to take that away. We're walking around irritable, and the world doesn't make sense. We're spiritually hangry, and Jesus speaks to that in John chapter 6 after he has just provided the miracle of Mark chapter 6 of the feeding of 5,000. So in Mark 6, this miracle is crazy. If you, if you stay with the story, Jesus just sent out the disciples on like their practice mission trip, and they're wildly successful, and so the crowd is bigger than ever because of what the disciples were able to do and what Jesus has done, and there's this rhythm in Jesus' life where he heals, teaches, heals, teaches, heals, and teaches, and then he simultaneously attracts people and offends people, attracts people and offends people, and that's just the dance you see throughout the Gospels, and so there's so many practical things that are happening in this story that are beautiful, where they bring him five loaves and two fish, and and whatever you bring to Jesus, he's capable of multiplying that and feeding as many people as they need, and there's, there's enough left over for all of them to have it, and he allows the disciples to participate, and there's some really great stuff, but in two chapters, he's going to feed 4,000, so we're going to cover all that stuff in two chapters. I thought we could take this moment to look at the teaching in John 6 to correspond the story in Mark 6 and see that Jesus is actually doing something on a deeper level here that we see in Mark chapter 6. And he's going to have a conversation with the crowd that he just fed. And he's going to cover one topic. And here's the topic. How to be satisfied on the deepest level. The largest crowd possible. He talks about how to be satisfied on the deepest level. And here's what's crazy. At the end of this conversation, the crowd does not get bigger. The crowd gets smaller. By the end of this teaching, the thousands are reduced reduced down to few because of Jesus' answer of what brings true satisfaction. People walk away from him instead of towards him. It's a crazy, powerful story. So in the context of just having fed the 5,000 in Mark 6, we see the the story, uh, the teaching that corresponds with it in John chapter 6, verse 25. It says, when they, they is the crowd, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, "Uh, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. In verse 27, he starts the conversation. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So he outs them pretty quickly. He's like, you guys want me to feed you again. That's why you're here. You're after that temporary filling, and I'd like to have a conversation about what fills you at a deeper level. So right away in this conversation, Jesus exposes the crowd's deepest need. He outs everybody. He says, you have a perceived need, hunger, food, but you actually have a deeper need, and I want to talk about that, something that fills you on a deeper level level. And the words in English are the word life, but in Greek, there's two words for life. There's the word bios and the word zoe. Bios is like physical life, material life. So think of she's giving her life to that project or uh, that costs their life savings. But then there's zoe, and that's the life that transcends the physical. This is the eternal. So think about baptism. When you dunk someone underwater, you say, you've been baptized. We buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of Zoe, the newness of life, the newness of transcendence. And so Jesus comes to his people and he's like, bread is bios. It's a material thing. Don't look for food that perishes, bios. Look for food that offers you eternal life, zoe. So he's telling the crowd, you have a hunger that transcends your physical hunger. You have a zoe hunger. You have a thirst inside of you that transcends your physical thirst. And you're looking for food to satisfy that need, but all the food you're looking for is bios, and I'm actually offering you zoe. And so Jesus, this is the principle from this. Jesus knows they have a zoe need that they are trying to fill with a bios solution. Jesus knows they have an eternal need 
a transcendent need built into where they are, like deep into their soul. They, they have this need, and they're trying to fill it with temporal things of this world, and he just outs them on it. He says, you're concerned with your stomach. I'm concerned with your heart. You, you're concerned with what's going on out there. I'm concerned with what's going on in here. And there's this angst that all of us carry. That's what's crazy about this text is all of us feel this. If, we, if we're honest enough, intellectually honest, spiritually honest, emotionally honest, and we look at the world around us, we know that things are not right. They're not perfect. You look in the mirror, it's not perfect. You look at the news, it's not perfect. We see brokenness around us. We know something's wrong. That's not the question. It's not, is something wrong? We all agree something's wrong. The question is, do we agree that Jesus knows how to fix the thing that's wrong? That he's the only one that can fix the thing that's wrong. Because humans have long been dedicated to figuring out what's wrong. As far back as you can look in, in written history, there's an existential angst. As far back as you can look, and some of us ignore it, some of us numb it, some of us try to fill it with different things, but we all know that there is a problem. Everyone is looking for Zoe. That's why everyone you meet probably says they're spiritual, but not religious. What they mean is, I'm desperate for transcendence. I'm desperate to be satisfied by something else that's out there because I know that there's a brokenness happening inside of me and happening in the world. I just don't know how to fill it. And there's typically like five classic ways we answer these big questions. So I want to share these with you. These are things that we run to that are good things, but that, but that can become ultimate things and ultimately can break us. So the first thing oftentimes we look to is uh, when, when we're trying to fill this angst inside of us is a better version of myself trying to answer the question, do I matter? Which is a big question. Do I matter in the world? And if I do matter, then I need to, I need to be the best version of myself. And so often this looks like waking up earlier in the morning. Great. Being more productive. Great. Getting more social media followers. Growing your business. Taking ice baths, if that's the new thing that people are doing. Uh, which It's like, here, here's the key to life. Get up really early and get in cold water. It'll heal every, it's, yeah, see, it's working. Not a bad thing. Let me reiterate, not a bad thing. Losing weight, getting in shape, being the best in your field, which are all good things, but the truth is none of them will satisfy. Whatever picture you have of your best future self, know that if you ever attained that, it instantly wouldn't satisfy. It instantly wouldn't answer the question, do I matter? A better version of yourself can't do it. So maybe that's not your thing. Maybe the next one is someone else. So, so the question is, am I loved or am I lovable? And so you look to other people and you say, I need, I need a significant other to, to fulfill me and all my frustrations will go away. I need to be completed by someone else. And every married person is like, that does not work. Trust me. And every single person is like, I don't trust you. I must try for myself. <laughs> it's, it's just how it works. It's just how it works. The sinful soul is so broken. That even when you get the thing you thought you wanted, it instantly turns on you and is not the thing you wanted. And if you're of my age, our whole generation was lied to by this really great movie called Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire is incredible. If you're younger and you don't know, the actor from Top Gun, his name is Tom Cruise. He was in another movie called Jerry Maguire. And in the crescendo of Jerry Maguire, he lies to a generation when he yells at Renee Zellweger, you complete me. That led all of us to seek someone to complete us when in fact that is a generational lie and curse that we're all living under. And if you're like, it wasn't me, Josh, you're a liar. You were totally looking for someone to complete you. You totally were. And what you found in that person is incompleteness. And maybe there's something deeper going on there, that there is someone who can complete you, but it is not someone that you fall in love with relationally, romantically. So maybe that's not your thing. Maybe, maybe it's stuff. The next question is, do I measure up? And so this little thing that you're holding in your hand, it constantly feeds you discontentment, and it tells you all day long, you've never had dinner at that restaurant You've never skied at that place. You've never gone on vacation there. You've never hiked that trail. You've never bought that vehicle. You've never lived in this kind of home improvement house or whatever the next thing is. And it's sowing discontentment in your heart. And it's not helping with the angst. It's not working. But trust me, you will try. And I have tried to fill the void with buying new stuff or, or, or figuring out how to get more followers. And there's this classic phrase. I don't know who made it up but that many people are spending money they don't have on things they don't need to impress people they don't like. 
It's just happening. And you're like, not me. Yes, it's you too. This is, this is, a, this is a shared confession time. <laughs> I'm confessing for all of us. And you go, maybe that's not your thing. Okay, the fourth one is uh, addiction. Can I just make it go away? The angst, can I just push it aside? Can I just disassociate myself with substances or maybe food or video games or work? I'm just going to throw myself in and become addicted to something else because I can't deal with the, the significance of what's going on inside of me. The angst is too much. I just have to, I have to disassociate completely and I fall into addiction. Or maybe it's religion. We start to ask the question, maybe I, can I save myself? So something's obviously needing to happen. Maybe if I t- participate in enough religious activity, I can fix this. And so many people in church are like trying to pass a test or trying to do a good grade on a test that's never going to be given. But they give these rules to themselves. And so that's the, that's the idea of fulfillment. And Jesus comes along and the feeding of 5,000 and the teaching that goes along with that feeding. And he's saying this. If you find your life in things that perish, you will never be filled. If you find your life in things that wear off and fade, you will never be filled. Because those things are temporary, not eternal. They are bios, not zoe. We've seen this. I remember in 2001, that was the year I graduated high school, and Trent Dilfer was the quarterback of the Baltimore Ravens, and they won the Super Bowl 34 to 7 against the Giants. And Trent Dilfer sat in the locker room, and he told a reporter that this was the loneliest moment of his life. And I'm like, bro, I'm a senior in high school. I'm like, you just achieved what everyone wants to achieve Super Bowl winning quarterback, and you sit in the locker room saying, this is the loneliest moment of my life. There's an artist named Vince Staples, and he has an album uh, called Prima Donna, and in the song called Smile, he says, I know that money comes and goes, so money's not my motive anymore. I've made enough money to know that I'll never make enough money for my soul. Again, this existential angst being sent out. Tom Brady, uh, after winning all these Super Bowls in a 60-minute interview, he goes to the reporter and says, at the end of it all, the question is, is there more to life than this? Existential angst. Jim Carrey famously said, I wish everyone could experience being rich and famous so that they'd see that that is, that is the answer to nothing. And yet all of us are like, I would like to try that, Jim Carrey. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Yeah. One philosopher said, the loneliest moment in life is when you have just experienced that which you thought would deliver the ultimate satisfaction and you realize that it overpromised and it lets you down. We see this testimonially. People are telling us this. Celebrities, public speakers, we, we've heard this, that, that pursuing status or reaching the top, it's never going to deliver the wholeness that you're after. And the answer is because you, you're hungry for something deeper. You're hungry for a bread that can fill you on a deeper level. And so here comes Jesus in John chapter 6 telling the crowd, he tells them, Jesus says, I know you need a Zoe solution for your Zoe need. Jesus says, I know that about you. None of those things I just mentioned are bad things. They just can't be ultimate things. They're not going to fix the problem. Tim Keller says, idolatry is making a good thing an ultimate thing. It's a good thing. It's fine. It just can't be a God thing. It can't be the thing that satisfies you, gives you identity, gives you purpose, gives you vision for your future. But the tension is many of us are taking good things and putting them in a place that they cannot sustain. And so no matter how much we perform, we can't fill the void. We can't find our identity. We can't find fulfillment. It leads us exhausted and bitter. And Jesus knows this enough, and he loves us enough to tell us the truth. So he exposes our deepest need. You need zoe, not bios. He exposes that. And then in verse 30, he goes on. So he tells them that. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see and believe it? What will you do? Which to me is the most offensive verse ever because Jesus just fed them, he's healed, he's taught, and they come to him like, okay, this, this whole like give me life thing, maybe. What sign will you do? And Jesus has to be like, are you kidding me? I just made bread and fish appear. <laughs> and, you got... and then they turn on him, they bring up the Old Testament, verse 31. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verse 32, Jesus in his infinite patience says, very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. 
So Jesus doesn't just expose their deepest need. The next thing he does is he exposes their motivation. He tells them what's going on underneath. And he, he says, listen, you're seeing the bread and you want the gift of the bread instead of the giver of the bread. That's your motivation. You want the stuff instead of the giver of the stuff. You want God's hands instead of God's face. That's your motivation. You're not in this for me. You're in this for the stuff I give. And he just tells them that. But he says this, like, hey, if we're, if we're going to talk about bread, then let's talk about bread. If you want to bring up the bread story from the Old Testament, I'd be happy to bring up the bread story from the Old Testament because there's something going on there that absolutely applies to this conversation. So in Exodus chapter 16, after God freed his people from Pharaoh and the enslavement there, he brought them across the Red Sea, through the Red Sea, And they're supposed to go to the promised land, but they doubt and they sin against God. And so they find themselves wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And every day for 40 years, God miraculously provides manna from heaven. Every day. And enough for two days on Friday so they don't have to carry stuff on on the Sabbath. So stay with me. Manna, bread, would fall from heaven. After God's people had been enslaved, they're free from slavery, they're given manna on their way to the promised land. There's symbolism here. And Jesus tells the people, that's actually not about Moses. It was God who gave the bread, and you're looking again for the gift instead of the giver. You're looking at the stuff and missing the supplier of the stuff, and you're doing it right now. That's a tempt- you're continuing to do that. He's saying, I am the bread of heaven. I am the one who comes daily to provide for you the nourishment you need to survive. I'm God's gift to you. I'm just like the bread that came from heaven while you were wandering in the wilderness. So before you go to the promised land, this is the bread that's provided for you. It's me. I am your daily provision in the wilderness. Again, are you catching the symbolism here? He's like, I am all of these things. And then verse 34, they say, sir, they said, always give us this bread. That's what they say in response to Jesus. Sir, that bread you're talking about, how about you always give that to us? Which is just heartbreaking because they don't say, oh, Jesus, we get it. Hey, Jesus, would you stay with us always? Would you stay with us always? Would you satisfy us always? Would you be near to us always? They, They don't say that. They say, give us this bread always. And Jesus exposes their motivation. He says, you're not here to be spiritually satisfied. You're here to be physically satisfied. You're not here for Zoe. You're here for Bios. You're not here for me. You're here for the benefits you get from me, not the relationship with me. You want miracles. You want more goodies. You want more magic tricks. You're not here for satisfaction. You're here for stuff. And here's the the truth. If you're in this, for the benefits of Christianity, not the Christ of Christianity, then Christ, Christ, let me try that again. This is so important. My braces got me right there. That was, that was the devil because this is like the best, that was, this is like the best, it's the best sentence in the whole sermon. It's practice. If you are here, if you're in this, for the benefits of Christianity, not the Christ of Christianity, you will miss the beauty of Christianity. If you're in this for the gifts, then you're going to miss the whole thing because it's not about the gifts. The beauty of the whole thing is the relationship with the giver, not the relationship to the gifts. Relationship is what brings change, not just fanhood. I'm a fan of Michael Jordan. That has not changed me. I'm a fan of Justin Timberlake. That has not changed me. It's changed me like a little bit, but not that much. (laughs) Relationship changes. My parents have changed me. My wife has changed me. My friends have changed me. And Jesus is saying, it's in the relationship you are changed and you keep missing it. He's saying to them, I'm providing bios, bread, for you as a way to prove that I am Zoe, bread. When I gave you the bread, you were supposed to see the giver instead of the gift, but you keep seeing the gift and not the giver. And so when you're motivated by this, you're going to miss out on Christianity. You're going to constantly say, God, I'm in it for the stuff. I'm not in it for you. And Jesus loves us enough to say, that's not the design. So he exposes their deepest need, Zoe, and then he exposes their motivation. You want the gifts, not the giver. And in the crescendo of this passage, Jesus exposes their allegiance. In verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the turning point. This is the line in the sand. This is the declaration across all of human history that must be dealt with. What we were, we were talking around it before, but now we are talking about it. Jesus is so clear. He says, I have not come to bring bread. I have come to be bread. I have not come to improve your life. I have come to be your life. I am the true Zoe. I am the only solution to your spiritual hunger. I am the only solution to your existential angst. Your hunger will never be satisfied outside of me. Friends, there is no greater claim in human history. There's no crazier claim in human history. Jesus of Nazareth says, I am what you're looking for. I am what you need. To have me and to have nothing else is to have everything. What a claim. This sentence, this claim is, is implying something massive. Because if Jesus is saying, come to me, I'm the bread of life, I'm the true Zoe, I'm the only one that satisfies, then he is also saying, you must therefore turn away from whatever else it is in your life that you are looking to to find satisfaction. Whatever bread you are holding in the presence of Jesus must then be dropped in front of him. You cannot say to him, no thanks, Jesus, I'd like to keep my own bread. But that's what the crowd says. They say, they say we can't do that. We, we want our bread. I tell you what, Jesus, we'll add you as an ingredient to our bread. How about that? We'll put God first in our bios. Like, can we just add you in but like not change anything? Can, can we just like keep you close by and like kind of add you on top of the, the life we've already chosen? And here's the temptation. We can make fun of the, the people that were following Jesus and seeing all the signs and wonders, but this same temptation is in front of us today. Many of us want to identify with Jesus while not being inconvenienced by Jesus. Many of us would like to say, man, yeah, totally, I follow Jesus, but he better not bother me. He better not bother my life, my decisions, my choice. That's, that's all me, man. I give him like an hour and a half, one day a week, and we're cool. We like Jesus to give us stuff. Like, by the way, I'm in the same boat with you. This is the tension on all of us. We like Jesus to, who gives us stuff. We just don't like the Jesus who asks things of us. We don't like authoritative Jesus. We don't like Jesus meddling in my life. We like Jesus being Savior. We, we don't like his lordship. And as soon as Jesus draws the line and demands the allegiance of the crowd, they turn from him. They turn from him. Some scholars say this was like second, maybe beginning of the third year of his ministry when we start to see these miracles pick up and this teaching happens. So some of these people have been following him for a while. But when this line is drawn, they cannot go there. They walk away because of whatever bread is that they're holding in their hand. And I'm not going to pretend that they're any better than us. I think there are some of us that are in the same place. When, when Jesus comes to us and says, I am the bread of life, we look at the bread in our hands and we say, no thanks, Jesus. I have all I need right here. I have all I need in my job. I have all I need in my relationships. I have all the security I need in my money. I have all the vision I need for my future dreams right here. My addiction will not be changing. Uh, my self-help plan is going to keep happening. My boyfriend or girlfriend, it, that, that's all I need. And if you're asking me, Jesus, to take this stuff off of the throne of my life, then I have no interest in doing that. I can't. It's too hard, Jesus. And if that's you and that's, that's me, let, let me, let me plead with us for a second. Those things that we're clinging to, they will never truly give you life. And they will constantly demand from you. They will ultimately exhaust you. They will make you bitter and they will lead you to despair. And then you'll just try other things, which we've all done. And you'll try everything possible, like many of us have done, but ultimately all of those things will perish and they will leave you wanting and they will leave you broken. But the temptation of the Christian life is that. 
This is the battle of the Christian life. This is what daily disciples have to fight with. Putting Jesus on the throne, allowing him to be our ultimate satisfaction. I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm saying this is ground zero for the battle. And Jesus loves us enough to put it out there to the crowd. So why should we put Jesus on the throne? Why is he worthy of dethroning everything else so that he can have our ultimate allegiance? Why is he worthy of that? How could he possibly make such a claim? Here's how. Because Jesus is the only bread that will break for you. He's the only bread that breaks for you. All the other breads out there will ask you to break for them. But Jesus is the only one that lives for you. Jesus is the only one that lays down his life for you. He's the only one that raises from the dead, proving he's not a liar and that he can be trusted. And Jesus then comes to us. According to Ephesians chapter 2, he finds us dead in our transgressions starving, filled with a stomach full of substitutes, eating so that only we could be hungry again, drinking only to become thirsty again, looking for life everywhere we can and nowhere do we find it. And Jesus comes to us and says, hey, I I know where you are and I'm actually all you need. And I love you and I'm, I'm willing to expose your deepest need, Zoe. And I'm willing to expose your motivation that many of you are just looking for the gifts, not the giver. And I know that your allegiance is weak, but I'm here and I'm offering myself to you because I love you. And and I don't want you to be hungry anymore. I want you to feast on my grace. I want you to drink in the cup of forgiveness and I want you to experience that which satisfies you. And it sounds like great news. It sounds like this should be incredible news. As Jesus presents this, you'd be like, man, this is so beautiful. Surely they respond but they miss it. The crowd misses it. They say this teaching is too hard. I cannot accept it. And they walk away. They walk away. We see this in verse 66, further down in the story. It says this, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and they no longer followed him. Many of his disciples turned back and they no longer followed him. Verse 67, you don't want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So we see the the feeding of 5,000 in Mark chapter 6. We see the beauty of that story. And oftentimes we can be like, wow, that's so awesome. But this, this teaching that corresponds shows you what was happening below the surface. After this teaching, the, fo- the crowd goes from 5,000 down to twelve. Now, it is not our hope that only 12 of you come back next week. That's not the goal. But here, real talk. Our response to Jesus claiming to be the bread of life shows us what's going on in our heart. And this is the part of the story where where our hearts are revealed. Because false belief, when Jesus draws the line, false belief, it hardens, it gets mad, it says, your words are too hard, I can't listen to them. False belief hardens, It preserves, it protects, it controls. It says, don't touch my stuff. Don't look at this thing that's over here. I don't know if you do this with Jesus, but you put something behind your back and like that's the only thing he wants to talk about. You ever tried that with Jesus? You're like, hey, Lord, how's it going? He's like, can we just talk about what's behind your back? Just cut to the chase. Yeah, that's what he does because he loves you. That's a very loving thing to do. True belief, when the line is drawn, true belief, it softens. It's sustained by Jesus. It's softened by Jesus. It looks back at Jesus and says, man, you're the one that has the the truth of eternal life. You have the words of life. True belief says there's nowhere else I want to go. Even though this teaching is hard, there's nowhere else I want to go. Martin Lloyd-Jones famously, he's a famous preacher from, from history, and he talks about this passage, and he says something crazy. He says, anyone who has any conceivable alternative to Jesus Christ is not a Christian. That's a big statement. But this is, this is the reality of Jesus saying, I am the only thing that satisfies. There's nowhere else I want to go. But here's the practical implications of this. And I, I've felt this. I've been a pastor 16, 17 years. And I can tell you, I've been so heartbroken by the amount of people that have walked away from Jesus because they couldn't give up the bread in their hands. I've seen it. It's been heartbreaking. And listen, I, I know I've only been here six, seven months, but here, here's what I know. It will not be long Grace Church, 
before the authority of Jesus collides with the strongly held belief you have in your hands. And in that moment, you will have to make a choice. A strongly held belief will collide with the authority of Jesus. And many people in that moment have said, I cannot give that to you. And they walk away. And many people have chosen the sweetness of sin over the promise of the bread of life that fulfills and satisfies. And many people walk away from the only bread that will break for them. And they walk away from Zoe. And they miss life and they miss satisfaction and they miss the the promise that God has given and they remain in the wilderness. And they miss out on the glory. And so listen, I, I know that you have an angst inside of you. I have it inside of me. And I know that you want to be satisfied. So come to Jesus the true bread of life, the true thing that satisfies, the one that can actually fulfill all the other things. And that's the only place to find life. Here's one of the scariest things about what the Bible teaches. One of the scariest teachings in all the Bible is the Bible teaches that outside of Jesus, there is existence, but there is no such thing as life. Christ says, I'm life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He he says, only in me do you find the thing that you were looking for. And so, so Grace, this is the invitation to us every, every day. Come to Jesus and find life. Find life right now. Find life eternal. This is what the resurrection is all about. It's proving that life is on the table for the whole world. Life is on the table for all of us. We can come forward and feast on the grace of God and drink deeply the cup of forgiveness. We can enjoy God right now. We can enjoy him eternally. That is the promise and the offer that God gives us. But in a similar fashion, when you are physically hangry, it takes a couple of bites of food before the world starts to make sense again. In the same way, you are spiritually hungry. And if you want to be healed of your spiritual hunger, it's going to take a couple of bites of bread, the true bread of Zoe, before the world makes sense again. And so that's the invitation we have this morning. I'm going to invite the band to come back up, and we're going to participate in communion in just a moment. And this is the offer that's available to us, that we can come forward and break open our cup, and we can see symbolically the teaching that Jesus gave in Mark 6 and John 6, that his blood was spilled for us so that we would never be thirsty again, that we could could drink deeply the forgiveness of God, that his body was broken for us so that we could never be hungry again that we can enjoy the grace of God. And so my, my hope for us, in just a moment, we're going to have communion. We'll have prayer partners up here if you need someone to pray with. But here's the invitation. Come forward and confess that we are being satisfied by other things. And ask Jesus again, Jesus, would you fulfill me again? Would you satisfy me again? And ask Jesus to help you in the ongoing temptation of making good things ultimate things. And let's enjoy the grace of God together. Let's enjoy the forgiveness of God together. Enjoy the peace of God together. And celebrate that because Christ laid down his life, we now can have life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that your word is good and true. God, I pray that as a church in this next 10 minutes together, we could feast on your grace. God, I pray that as a church, we could drink deeply your forgiveness. And I pray that as we sing and as we take communion, as we pray together, that God, something would happen in this room right now that would satisfy the desire we have in our hearts for transcendence, the desire to be made whole, to be at peace. God, that you would satisfy us. This is what the psalmist says, God, that that at the right hand, at your right hand is the fullness of joy, the fullness of our pleasure. That you provide that for us, God. So now as we sing, Lord, and as we take communion, would you be among us, satisfying your people? Give us the courage, Lord, to dethrone anything else that's on the throne. Be our satisfaction. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.